Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining uh, this our first uh, Kirby seminar series done by teams that have involved external uh, people as well as our internal community at the Kirby. Uh, we ran one of these internally last week and it ran very well without too many hitches. So the Kirby has uh, initiated a a range of uh, research responses to COVID-19 uh, and Rainer is, is uh, leading uh, several of those. Rainer has been uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, representative for the Kirby in her interactions with the media, doing a great job in communicating the major issues around COVID-19 uh, to the public in general on all sorts of media. Despite uh, her uh, very significant commitment uh, to that endeavour, she has managed to uh, get on with her research agenda uh, and uh, has uh, already produced uh, papers uh, modelling the epidemic and also uh, the, uh, on uh, other papers on the behaviour of aerosols and what the uh, implications of that are for appropriate PPE. So uh, this is the second uh, update from Rainer on COVID-19 uh, and uh, I'll hand over to her to, um, to uh, tell us uh, about where we're up to in this epidemic and she's even going to tell us how we might be able to navigate our way out of this. Uh, thanks Rainer. Thank you Tony. So um, I'm not going to repeat things that I went over last time um, and I think that's available recorded if you want to see it. I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, where UNSW is, it's the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are um, joining us on this webinar. Um, my only disclosure is that I received funding from Sanofi, who's working on a vaccine for COVID, but for influenza research. So just to um, bring you back to the global epidemiology, this graph shows you in the red the epidemic curve for China and then the rest of the world in green. And we've seen waves of um, disease affecting different parts of the world. So after just as China was coming under control um, in the um, end of February, beginning of March, we began to see a surge of cases in Italy, South Korea and Iran. Um, whilst Iran and South Korea got things a little bit under, well, South Korea got things very well under control. Iran, um, to some extent, the epidemic really took off in Europe um, uh, after that. And then shortly after that began to take off in the United States. Interestingly, in New York State, they saw their first case on March the 1st, the first documented case. And by the end of March, uh, New York was very much the epicenter in the world. This is the Australian situation from the Commonwealth Department of Health um, website. And you can see that our epidemic uh, curve peaked sometime uh, towards the end of April, uh, end of March, beginning of April and then has declined substantially since then. And we're seeing just cases in the double and single digits uh, now. Um, below the, the graph, you can see the age distribution. And the main thing to note is that there's quite a lot of cases in the 20 to 29 age group and younger age groups, whilst the last graph on the, bo the, graph on the bottom shows the hospitalizations and deaths, sorry, the deaths are much more in older people, but we have had deaths in the 40s and 50s. So I'll talk a little bit about the case fatality rate um, because it is a contentious point. It definitely has varied between countries from 1 to 15 percent. We know that it increases with age and once you are admitted to hospital and to ICU, the case fatality rate goes up even more. Uh, uh, from China of hospitalised cases, the case fatality was between 11 and 15 percent. It was higher in Italy. Uh, once you're in ICU, the case fatality rate is 50 percent. Now, these rates compare with 12 percent for SARS, 36 percent for MERS coronavirus, 2 to 5 percent um, for the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic, 
0.3 to 0.6 per cent for the 1957 flu pandemic and only 0.1 to 0.01 for the 2009 influenza pandemic. So it's telling you that compared to those um, events, it's quite a significant case fatality rate. This graph just shows you how much it um, varies between countries. Um, the numbers on the top are the number of ICU beds per 100,000 population, and the red bar is the, is the case fatality. So the highest is actually France, about 15, followed by the United Kingdom, which is about 13, then Italy, Spain, Sweden uh, is about nine, the United States, China, Germany, South Korea, and Australia has a very low case fatality rate. Um, interestingly, it sort of correlates with the number of ICU beds per head of population, but, but there are some countries, including us, uh, where the um, rate, case fatality rate's low, but the ICU bed capacity is um, not that high, although we have more than doubled our ICU bed capacity um, through the efforts across all the states and territories. Um, but you'll note that the United States, despite having the most number of cases, their case fatality rate is not as high as, say, France, and perhaps it's their ICU bed rate that matters. And what happens is people die of respiratory failure. So if you can't ventilate people, then the case fatality rate goes up. And that's certainly what we saw in Europe, that um, the ability to ventilate people was exhausted and therefore people were being denied an ICU bed, often based on age. And that's just this, in the same order, the country is showing you the number of cases, just to highlight the fact that the US had many more cases than the other countries, but the case fatality rate was less. Um, the other interesting thing, and this was seen in SARS-1 as well, and this is a graph from Abra Chugtai at the School of Public Health at UNSW and Community Medicine, and um, is that in SARS-1 as well, the case fatality rate seemed to be very low at the beginning, but as it went on, it got higher and higher. And the same thing can be seen in different countries um, with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is that um, and I think that's partly because uh, you get case numbers immediately, but people are in hospital for several weeks before they die. So the case, the death data lags behind the case data quite substantially sometimes, um, and the recovery data as well lags even more than that. So once those data start coming in, the case fatality rates get updated. And we've heard just this week that China has doubled the number of deaths that it's reporting from Wuhan. Um, going on to the age distribution, this shows in the data from China and what you can see is that the majority of cases were in the 40 to 69 age group and I'll just flick straight to the next slide which then compares Italy in the green with South Korea in the red and Italy is similar to China with a little bit more shift towards older age groups. And I think in both China and Italy, what it reflects is that the people accessing healthcare and getting to the hospital systems were the most severely ill and they were being counted, whereas people with more mild illness were not being counted. And so you get this um, artificial shift towards older age groups. But in actual fact, the South Korean data is probably more like the true um, distribution of disease. Um, and you get, again, you see this big peak in the 20 to 29 age group, which we see in Australia as well, which means that that age group is probably transmitting it the most. I just want to touch on some concepts that are relevant to epidemic control and our exit strategy, which is the reproductive number R's R, which is the number of secondary cases generated from one index case. So if we're all in a room together and I've got COVID-19 and I infect three of you, then the R is three. Um, the lower the R, the easier it is to eradicate or control a disease. Here it is graphically uh, an R0 of three. So you can see that if we apply an intervention like vaccination to one third of the population, you effectively reduce the R to two from three to two. And that's what we do in disease control. We're aiming to drive that R value down with whatever means we can um, use. Some examples of R here show you that amongst the most infectious diseases that we know are pertussis, whooping cough and measles, followed by mumps, varicella, rubella, and that um, influenza is somewhere around two and SARS-CoV-2 probably somewhere around 2.6 to three. Smallpox was around three. The factors that affect R0 include the characteristics of the bug itself, 
um, how infectious it is, how long it's infectious for, and whether you've got asymptomatic transmission, and then characteristics of the population. So the demographics, the social mixing patterns, and the population density. And on the, the image there you can see is what's called a who acquires infection from who matrix, which is super important in respiratory transmissible diseases, um, because respiratory transmissible diseases spread very rapidly by the respiratory route. And um, it's important how many people have contact with each other by age, by age groups. Um, and typically we see the most intense amount of contact, uh, as you can see in this matrix, in young people. Um, and so I should mention the R0 would be different in a big city compared to a country town. It will be less in a country town for the same disease. So if R is greater than one, the number of cases can increase and the conditions are present for an epidemic. If R is less than one, the number of cases decreases and infection can't be sustained. And R equals one is called the epidemic threshold. And um, this is the the um, this is this defines what we call the critical proportion susceptible. Um, and we look at how many people are susceptible in the population X. Um, and that is really important for disease control. And everything we do is aiming to bring that R below one. Now herd immunity is when the entire population is protected, whether or not they've been immunized because the number of susceptible people is too small for the infection to spread. And it's a concept that arose from vaccination. Um, herd immunity can be calculated mathematically based on the proportion of critical susceptible. Um, and the higher the R, the higher the herd immunity required to control it. And this is a really key concept. And I'll come to you know, the concept of herd immunity from natural infection. This graph show, is an elimination graph and it shows you the mathematical relationship between R and the percentage of people that need to be immune in the population for herd immunity. So for smallpox, which was the one of the only, the only human disease to be eradicated, um, it was around three, the R zero. So you only needed about 60% of people to be immune to eradicate smallpox. So smallpox eradication is much easier than measles. Measles eradication is going to be very difficult because it's so infectious. You need a very high proportion of the population immune before you can eradicate it. Um, COVID-19 is about is around the same value as smallpox, so um, that's good news because it means even if we don't have a great vaccine amongst the first vaccines that'll that'll arrive, um, even if it only has an efficacy of 70%, um, that still should be good enough to control COVID-19. So what if we allow transmission to achieve herd immunity? That means we're allowing transmission to get at least 60% of the Australian population infected. Now this is a population pyramid that's relatively recent for Australia and you can see that the 60% mark means we're going to have to have people, in, even if we're trying to infect just younger people, we're going to have to have people probably up to about 60 being infected to achieve that herd immunity. But um, it's, it's a bit of a fallacy, you know, I think in, in truth um, you you can't achieve herd immunity by letting an infection transmit. And let's just go back to what happens to infections if we let them circulate. Basically, they oscillate over time. They rise and they fall and they rise and they fall um, because the R0 keeps rising and falling um, with, with these waves of epidemics and new susceptible people coming into the population. This is what happened to mumps in Australia before um, we had widespread high levels of vaccination. And you see exactly that phenomenon. It rises and falls and rises and falls. And so um, you don't get rid of it. It just keeps coming back. And the, the rate of infection is very high. This is a model of measles before vaccination, which shows exactly the same thing. You don't get rid of measles by just letting it rip through the population. It'll keep coming back in massive waves over and over again. This is what happened with smallpox. There you can see, um, this is deaths, not cases, but you can see that before vaccination was introduced, you had these massive cycling epidemics and they still occurred after vaccination, but at a much, much lower level. So when you apply disease control, whatever that disease control is, you bring the cases right down. And I think, so what we'll get if we allow transmission is we'll result in, a, it'll result in a large increase in cases 
probably for little gain because by the time you get to about you know 20 or 30 percent of the population impacted you'll start putting the brakes on and having the lockdowns because the health system will be too severely impacted um, and we'll have these cycling epidemics we'll have large proportions of absenteeism from work we will see the full spectrum of disease as has been seen in um, the us the uk europe and in china which is that you will start seeing deaths in children infants and young people um, that's being seen right now in those countries and you'll see the health system capacity exceeded you'll start to see health workers dying as they're dying in the us in the uk and um, in europe and china um, and the healthcare infections and deaths is important because that will also impact your capacity to treat other conditions. If, if half your health for workforce is off sick or quarantine because you're having a massive outbreak in your hospitals, um, you, can, you, you, you might not be able to get treatment if you turn up with your myocardial infarction. Um, vulnerable populations, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, uh, will be severely impacted if we have severe transmission in the community. And I think there are ethical questions about uh, the implications of this idea of sacrificing vulnerable populations for the good of the young and the healthy. And I mean, to me, it, it does have a, um, uh, a connotation of, of eugenics. But I'll leave you to think about that. The pillars of epidemic control then, which are the interventions that we use to reduce R0, are number one case detection. We have to find every case and that's why the WHO says test, test, test and we isolate them and that act of isolating an infectious case stops the transmission. It can stop it completely. Contact tracing then of every con close contact of the cases and quarantining them for two weeks which is the incubation period so that if they develop symptoms they're not going to be infecting other people. Travel bans are really important and social distancing, which is the, the concept of the lockdown. You can do lockdowns in stages and in bits and pieces, or you can do a sharp, sharp short lockdown, uh, which will have a dramatic reduction in cases, and then you can start from a much lower baseline. Vaccines are, are what we're waiting for, and that's the ideal disease control strategy. Um, in the, in, until then, we can only use the non-pharmaceutical interventions, <clears throat> um, universal face mask use has been recommended in the US <coughs> and um, this is because um, it's thought that um, this can reduce infection and flatten the curve by both reducing infection outwards from a pre-symptomatic person and reducing infection inwards to well people but I'll, I'll touch on that later. So in terms of the um, flattening of the peak, the red, this is from Roy Anderson in The Lancet, and you can see that the red graph there shows you the un uninterrupted peak. That's what will happen if you don't do anything. The green is when you apply your social distancing, uh, and that's, you know, what we're um, seeing in Australia. But that when you lift those restrictions, you will see a resurgence, probably at a lower level because you're starting from a lower baseline and you can... Um, act on new cases quickly, but you really need expanded surveillance and testing to be able to mitigate that impact of the resurgence when you lift um, the, the restrictions. Here's a study that came out of the US which shows the impact on health systems. On the left are non-ICU and ICU admissions by age. And on the right, you can see the age-specific um, incidents and then the um, epidemic, the ICU bed occupancy, which is predominantly people who are 50 and over, and the threshold at which you will exceed that. Um, and by applying those social distancing, the graph F at the bottom shows that you exceed the threshold less. But uh, you, you, will, you know, if you exceed it substantially, you will start seeing a rise in case fatality. So what will happen if we maintain current interventions? Um, which is the uh, level of social distancing, the travel bans. Um, you'll probably see a creep up of the R0 back towards one and, and approaching one again. That happens with every infection, respiratory transmissible infection because there will be some asymptomatic transmission in the community. Um, and this is, this is what happens with um, interventions, any interventions, whether it's a vaccine, social distancing, universal face mask use, um, I've written vaccination there, but 
without anything, you have these big epidemics that just keep happening and you get an oscillation that tends towards one over a long period of time. When you apply 60% um, levels of intervention that are, that are impacting 60% of transmissions, the first thing you do is you lengthen the interepidemic cycle. So you make that period where you don't have an epidemic longer and you make the total number of cases fewer. And then if you have 80% intervention, you make that interepidemic cycle even longer and um, the number of cases lower. So that's what we're aiming for. Here's the study from Neil Ferguson and colleagues in Imperial College, which um, changed the course of the, um, of the control of the pandemic in the UK, which is um, showing you the do nothing scenario in black, followed by closing the schools and universities, case isolation, case isolation and quarantine and um, maximal interventions in the blue that you can make a huge difference. Um, we we modelled the impact of the initial travel bans on China um, to show that um, if we hadn't done those bans, we would have had a much larger epidemic. So they are really very effective when there's a lot of case incidents in other countries. A, a focused targeted ban on the country where there is a lot of disease will actually make a lot of difference. Um, in terms of lockdowns, I think China is the best example. They implemented the lockdown in Wuhan on the 23rd of January um, and they actually started seeing a reduction in cases within one incubation period in two weeks. Um, the peak had passed and the cases started to drop and they started relaxing those restrictions on the 9th of February, which is just two and a half weeks after that short, sharp lockdown. But that was a complete lockdown. It wasn't bit of this one day, a bit of that the next day and, you know, sort of dribs and drabs, but let's just shut it all down right now. And they've continued to relax those restrictions and um, allow resumption of activity. Wuhan has been opened and they're still not seeing a big uptick in cases. Of course, they could have a second wave, but um, what, what happens is when you do that sharp shock lockdown that you start from a much lower baseline. Instead of dealing with thousands and thousands of cases a day that's going to exhaust all your capacity, um, you're dealing with a few, you know, 20 to 50 to 100 cases a day, which is much easier to manage, so you can jump on any new cases as they occur. This is just to highlight again um, South Korea, which was different from China in the sense that they didn't go for the countrywide lockdown. They had very targeted lockdowns in the most heavily affected areas, but they vastly expanded testing to allow them to test every asymptomatic person in high risk groups, so contacts. Um, and they had the drive through testing and so on that we've started in, in Sydney now. And they totally flattened that curve. And remember, they started to surge at the same time as Italy and Iran. And you can see Italy in the green just continued to go up and they had that restricted testing criteria, only testing symptomatics. Um, and the same with Iran, though they've sort of brought things under control. Um, just want to look at our epidemic curve again in the context of all the significant events that have happened. So we had the, uh, I'll go back to the Diamond Princess and the Wuhan evacuations later, but I'll talk to you about the travel bans. Just look at the blue arrow. We started the bans on South Korea, Iran, and then Italy between the 5th and the 10th of March. And sure enough, within one incubation period, the epidemic peaks and starts to come down. And within two incubation periods, it's come right down. Um, so that, that impact is very much those travel bans. And we were 60% of the cases we're seeing were um, uh, overseas cases. This is another way of looking at it. I'd um, just like to thank Pro Professor Nunes Vez for providing these slides, which is looking at the doubling time, which is also a way of tracking how well people are going. So back in March, um, this is how we were looking. Um, there's Australia in the orange on the top graph, and you can see the doubling time's getting shorter and shorter, which is really very worrying. Um, whereas Republic of Korea in the green had gone right up. Um, the colours have changed in the second graph down the bottom, but this is today from uh, today, I think, um, or very recently. And you can see that Australia's done really well. The doubling time's gone right up. New Zealand's done well. Um, even um, Italy has been doing well and getting back on track. Uh, Republic of Korea, China at, at the beginning there. Um, but you can see Japan's a bit of a concern in terms of the doubling time getting lower. Um, there's also a question of how many people are really infected. So we used some data that came out of Japan from the initial evacuees from Wuhan to model 
the actual epidemic curve at the time that we implemented a travel ban in Australia, which was at the end of January, um, beginning of February. Um, so the red is the actual notified cases in China and the blue is what we estimated the epidemic curve to be um, in China at the time. And it actually fitted with our data pretty well. <coughs> what about population serological surveys, which tell us much more what's going on? So in Santa Clara, California, they did a survey um, which found 2.8% of people in the community were infected, which was 50 to 85 times more than the actual notified cases. In Vaux in Italy, um, they found 2.6% were infected before lockdown and 1.2% at the end of lockdown, which showed the impact of the lockdown as well. <coughs> this is a testing study from um, Iceland where they did a different uh, some targeted screening, population screening and random screening. And they found infected people in all age groups, um, which was um, uh, similar rates to what was found in um, California. Now, there is some data suggesting that people who have asymptomatic infection might not develop antibodies. So this Smith by Annalise Wilder Smith and colleagues that was done from um, cases in Singapore um, for SARS-1 um, showed that people who were asymptomatic um, didn't develop antibodies. There's this study um, on SARS-CoV-2 um, which, which shows that um, the antibody levels are much, much lower in asymptomatic people. So it could be that children, if they're largely getting asymptomatically infected, are not mounting a serological response. That could explain the um, lower seroprevalence, say, in the Iceland study in the 0 to 10 years age group. They, the, so in Iceland, they did find quite high levels of infection in the 10, 10 years and up age group. So, um, you know, older primary school to high school kids, um, but lower in the 0 to 10 group. And it may be that if they're asymptomatic, they're not mounting a serological response. Um, there has been prolonged viral shedding reported in children. Um, in one study, only 50% of children actually had mild infection, 30% had moderate to severe infection, and 6% required intensive care. And child and infant deaths have been reported in um, every country that's had a big epidemic, China, in several European countries, in the UK and in the US. A teacher infections and some deaths of teachers have also been reported in um, multiple countries. And um, the references to all of these studies are at the end of my slides. This is a really interesting study that's just come out um, looking at the characteristics of sh viral shedding for SARS-CoV-2 in children. And the two graphs down the bottom, the first one is from rectal swabs and the second one is from nasopharyngeal swabs. So it shows that you get more persistence with the rectal swabs and that's the R plus in the table on the top. But the graph's easier to follow. Um, for 27 days, really, you're getting rectal um, so, um, shedding. So, you know, I think that that's important in terms of thinking about whether children could be spreading infection asymptomatically from the fecal oral route. And we know that the gut has um, the ACE2 receptors in it. Uh, we know that the gut is affected. Um, and I think this just needs to be studied in more detail. Um, and children, this is just to remind you, panel D is a 10-year-old child um, who had no symptoms but had pneumonia, is that children have very high respiratory res reserve compared to adults. Um, so they can have pneumonia uh, but not have any symptoms, as was the case there, and that's been reported in other cases as well. Um, so just very briefly to cover what's new in clinical and immunological data, it is a very long, mild prodrome. Um, so people tend to have very mild, minimal symptoms for several days, up to a week before they seek medical care. And the viral shedding is really very long. Um, so it's more than 20 days in most of the studies that have looked at it. Um, about 25 to 50% of cases, depending on what study you look at, have underlying chronic diseases. Um, and about 14 to 20% might get the ARDS and pneumonia. Cardiac complications have emerged as quite substantial probably even more common than the respiratory complications, um, particularly arrhythmias, but also it appears that the virus directly affects the heart muscle and the vasculature. Um, 
uh, there's also been a range of autoimmune kind of syndromes de um, uh, described, including immune thrombocytopenia, coagulopathy, and antiphospholipid A antibodies. The anosmia that's been reported in numerous studies, um, it was thought that it was neurological, but there's been a study published that's suggesting that it's actually damage to the olfactory epithelium rather than the olfactory nerve. Um, the cytokine storm is still, I think the jury's still out. There's um, some evidence that it may be occurring, but there certainly is evidence that there's very broad ranging immune dysregulation in severe COVID-19, which is characterized by interleukin-6 mediated low HLA-DR expression and lymphopenia. And um, it, it, um, it's, it's very different to influenza and um, other infections. The question of reinfection, I think some of the cases that have been reported to be reinfected could be false negative tests at discharge. Um, probably a rectal swab is a better test than a throat swab or a nasopharyngeal swab at discharge. Um, certainly reinfection has been documented with the seasonal coronaviruses. With SARS-1, um, the, um, definitely there's a decline in neutralizing antibodies within 16 months and substantial decline by three years although the memory T cell response persists. And um, this, the um, people who've worked on vaccines for SARS and MERS, um, some of them feel that the T cell response is actually more important in protective um, immunity. And of course, there's been these um, unconfirmed reports of reinfection with COVID-19 causing more severe illness. There has been a study in four rhesus macaque monkeys that showed that they don't get reinfected, that they have high levels of antibodies, but that's just four monkeys. Um, there is some evidence that asymptom people who have asymptomatic infection may not mount a strong antibody response. Um, and it's some, maybe it's something to do with viral load, that if you've got asymptomatic infection and you don't get severe illness, the immune system doesn't kick in. And I, I don't know, but it's, it's early days. And uh, we've only got three to four months follow-up data on patients and really to understand the um, duration of immunity and what happens with the neutralizing antibodies you need to have 12 months of follow-up data at least so we really need to wait till december at the earliest to have that kind of data to know what happens but ideally you need symptoms uh, follow-up for multiple years following infection so in terms of this is um, data from the us from a large number of cases on comorbidities um, just to say that diabetes was the top comorbidity, almost 11%, followed by chronic lung disease and cardiovascular disease. Um, I'll just mention briefly that asthma hasn't seemed to feature much as a specific diagnosis, and there's some discussion about why. Um, immunocompromised conditions includes cancer, which is a um, concern. And just to mention that that study didn't look at hypertension specifically, but the subjects, the studies that do look at hypertension generally find that hypertension is the number one comorbidity. So in this study, it was 30% of patients had hypertension. Whether that's related to the use of ACE inhibitors for treatment of hypertension is not known. And I'm sure there's people studying it. Um, in terms of the treatment, um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, just to say that the data that's come out so far does not show, we haven't got evidence of efficacy of hydrochloroquine. Um, there is evidence of re reducing the symptom um, duration, but and there are trials ongoing. Um, lopinavir and ritonavir, two RCTs so far have been negative, not shown a survival benefit. There's other trials ongoing. Remdesivir, the trials are ongoing, and we might see results in this month or next month. Plasma from recovered patients as well. There's trials going on. Um, I've just mentioned the ACE inhibitors gain. Of course, the ACE inhibitors um, inhibit ACE1, uh, whereas the um, virus binds to the ACE2 receptors. Um, and there's there's some debate. Some people are saying, well, it might actually help because the ACE inhibitors have anti-inflammatory properties, but they do upregulate the ACE2 in, uh, receptors. So there's also the potential that they could um, make the infection worse. But the current recommendations from peak bodies in cardiology is if you're on an ACE inhibitor for your hypertension, please keep taking it. Um, I'll come back to vaccines right at the end, um, but I think that is, you know, what we're, there's a lot of groups working on it. Um, uh, Sanofi is developing an mRNA vaccine and they're using the um, pandemic um, 
Age of Ed from GSK. So GSK and Sanofi are collaborating on this. And there's a lot of research groups um, who've worked on MERS vaccines in the past and SARS vaccines in the past also working on vaccines. Um, so moving on to transmission, which is the um, hot topic of the moment, I think. Um, we know it's a respiratory virus, um, but the ACE2 receptors are present not just in the respiratory tract, but in the gastrointestinal tract, the kidneys and the heart. Um, you know, SARS-1 was spread by contact droplet and airborne. Um, we were told at the beginning that SARS-2 is um, spread by contact and droplet, but saying that is not based on evidence. There's, you know, we've certainly got evidence that surfaces are contaminated, um, that you can find the virus in the upper respiratory tract, um, but it's an assumption. And uh, we do know from multiple studies now that the viral load is higher in the lung, in the lower respiratory tract, than it is in the upper respiratory tract which is consistent with it being preferentially airborne, but also drop, droplet spread. Um, there's been numerous studies now that have shown extensive contamination in hospital wards. It's been found in air vents and in air samples in ICU and COVID, COVID wards. I'll come back to that later. Um, and there's been documented self-contamination, including ocular transmission, which is important. So it's important to wear eye protection for healthcare workers. Um, there's no evidence of vertical transmission, but certainly transmission during birth or shortly after birth. The virus has also been found in the blood of asymptomatic blood donors. So that raises another question about um, blood-borne transmission. Uh, another interesting study from Massachusetts in the US um, where they tested the wastewater found extensive viral contamination uh, and if you projected that to how much infection there was in the community, it was much, much more than was actually notified from official notifications. So um, testing of wastewater might be a way of um, estimating community infection rates. And uh, it also raises the question of pathogenic virus being in the water supplies and the wastewater in a similar way that we think about polio and um, polio um, elimination, that it's important to think about um, excretion of um, the virus. This is another reason why live viral vaccines is probably not the best approach for SARS-CoV-2 um, because um, like with polio and vaccine derived polio, you see reversion of the vaccine strain to pathogenicity in the environment and um, um, that could be a risk with SARS-CoV-2. So um, just going back to that question of the long duration of viral shedding, this is, um, tables in survivors at the top and non-survivors at the bottom in a study published in The Lancet. And the pale blue bar at the bottom shows the duration of viral shedding. And it's equally long for survivors and non-survivors. It's 20 plus days. And day one is from the day of diagnosis at hospital. So you can assume that they've been shedding virus prior to day one as well, maybe for up to seven days. So it's very, very long viral shedding. So pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission is really key to the control of the disease and um, exit strategies and what we can do about um, controlling the disease. Now there have been multiple studies that have confirmed that up anywhere between 17 to 50% of all infections are asymptomatic, so people who never develop symptoms. Um, and 44% of transmissions are from pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic people. So in the, the two days before you develop symptoms, if you're gonna develop them, that's when a lot of the transmissions occur. Um, and it's also because you don't, you're not aware that you're infectious, so you're more likely to be infecting people. From China, we know that 70% of transmissions are in the household. And um, a couple of other studies from there show that probably before the infection was diagnosed. Uh, and the direct transmission from an asymptomatic person to someone else has also been documented. So I think we can't deny the importance of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. This study has just been published in um, Nature Medicine and by He et al. And this is showing the viral load detected by RT-PCR in throat swabs from in 94 infected patients. And what you can see, uh, 
um, just look at the graphs that have the um, red and the green, the red and the blue bars on them. The red is people with severe infection and the, the blue is people with mild infection. And generally there's not a lot of difference. They look pretty similar. They've both got almost equally high um, um, viral shedding and the highest viral shedding is on day one or day zero. And then, um, then they, they use this data then um, to model the uh, amount of pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic transmission. Now, just initially look at SARS in 2003, SARS-1 on the right-hand side at the top there, and you can see that all of the viral shedding or the transmission is after the symptoms have developed. So that's much easier to control because you know who's infectious, you can identify them. And below that is seasonal influenza. And we've known for a long time that you can get pre-symptomatic transmission of seasonal flu, but the majority of the transmission is still after symptoms start and you can get some before the symptoms start. Now move back to the left and look at SARS-CoV-2, which is from the, the viral shedding data I just showed you. And there's three possible scenarios that they've modeled. One is that about half the transmission is before the symptoms start. That's the top bar. The second is that almost all of it is before the case, before the symptoms start. And the uh, and the third is a, another distribution of that. So that's kind of um, very um, challenging in terms of disease control to have a substantial amount of infectiousness um, before the symptoms start. In terms of the healthcare setting, I thought this was an interesting study that's just come out as well, where they screened everyone presenting, pregnant women presenting to an antenatal clinic, and they actually found 13% um, were positive um, and asymptomatic and 2% were positive and symptomatic. So I think for a hospital setting where you are um, in a country or a city where there's a lot of infection, it's a real concern for oncology patients, hematology patients, any vulnerable patients who are coming in um, and pregnant women obviously to think about, and the pregnant women are in that age group likely that are high transmitters, the 20 to 29s. Um, it's thinking about screening patients is probably important to prevent nosocomial transmission. So uh, moving on then to other evidence of um, transmission in the hospital environment. This study, um, they collected swabs and samples from um, three different patients and one, two patients didn't have a lot of environmental contamination, but this one patient did. And that's just showing you that it was everywhere. It was on the control panel, the um, locker, the chair, the light switches, the floor, um, the windows, the door handles, um, and on an air outlet fan. Um, it was also on the shoe covering of one of the um, staff and on the, um, yeah, on the shoe covering, which relates to infection on the floor, which has been found in multiple studies. Um, and this study um, was an experimental study where they looked at um, um, viral persistence on different surfaces and in aerosols. And they found that the SARS-CoV-2 virus persists for um, up to three hours in aerosols in the air. Um, copper is very um, antimicrobial. It's got antimicrobial properties. So it was least persistent on copper, but on other surfaces, particularly plastic and stainless steel, it could su um, survive for a few days. Um, so moving on to this um, issue of droplet versus airborne transmission. Um, the droplet transmission, the theory of it is that um, when someone is breathing or coughing or sneezing, that they will emit large particles that will are heavy and they'll fall to the floor within one to three feet or, or um, one to two meters and smaller particles become airborne and um, can travel further. And it's based on very, very old um, data. So Pratik Bal, who is one of our UNSW PhD students, has just published this paper in JID where we looked at the evidence for this um, um, rule of spatial separation, you know, keep your distance, social distancing, we're told, stand 1.5 metres apart. That's an average of one to two metres. Um, it's based on this top study here, Jenison, 
uh, which was from 1942, using very blunt camera equipment to photograph particles. Obviously, things have got a lot more sophisticated since then, but you can see that most of the other studies show that droplets, large droplets, travel much further than two meters. So probably the reality is anywhere inside a standard hospital room, you're gonna be at risk if there's a patient in there with COVID-19. Um, and this, this is just to reiterate that um, in, in our research, we've shown that if N95s protect even against supposed droplet infections, which again tells you that that separation of droplet and airborne infections is artificial. This is a really interesting study that's just come out from um, Hong Kong, which shows that um, they looked at a range of different viruses, but just let's just look at the coronaviruses. This is the seasonal coronaviruses, which is the top panel. The bottom, the other ones are influenza and rhinoviruses. So what this shows is that um, the coronaviruses are present in fine aerosols more than in large droplets, and um, that if you wear a mask, it doesn't come out at all. If the patient wears a mask, it doesn't come out in the aerosol. So that's good news and, and very supportive of using a, a mask on the sick patient. Um, but it's also telling you that um, the coronaviruses preferentially um, come out in fine aerosols. And this was from normal breathing. It was There was no coughing involved. In normal breathing, um, people with coronavirus infection exhale the virus. Um, and it was present in fine aerosol particles. Um, the other studies that have looked at medical mask use, mask use by patients, um, include um, these four studies, which um, the Johnson study from Melbourne, um, they just got people to cough onto a petri dish and um, both the surgical mask and, N95, and a N95 prevented infection. Uh, not clinical infection in other people, but um, in detectable PCR detectable influenza. Um, in our trial, we found that um, it was protective if it was worn. And then there was a trial um, done in the Hajj pilgrims, which uh, where everybody wore the mask, um, whether you were sick or not. And that also looked like it was protective. So we've seen healthcare worker deaths in many countries now. There was a study done in the Sheffield Trust in the UK where they tested everybody and they found that one in five doctors and nurses were infected with COVID-19, which is really staggering um, when you think about that. Uh, there's also been studies from the US, Singapore and China now showing widespread contamination in the hospital ward, including in areas that are distal to the COVID patient area and separate. Um, one study found virus four meters from the patient and three studies have found virus in air samples showing that it's there in um, aerosolized air and also in the air vents which is also suggesting aerosolization in in one of those studies they found 35 percent of air samples in the icu ward that had the patients in it were positive for virus and 12 percent of the general ward next door um, and they also found 66% of air outlet um, vents in the ICU were positive and 8.3 in the general ward. So it's telling you it's getting out quite extensively in that area. It's a very contaminated area and it's not just surface contamination. There is aerosolized virus there. Now, the, some of the people will jump up and say, oh, but it's just, it's just fragments of viral RNA hanging around in the air. It's not viable virus. Well, I think somebody in the, uh, some groups in the US anticipated that and they did this amazing study. And this was done by five different lab laboratories who repeated the experiments um, independently. And one was US AMRAD, the US Army Medical Research um, Institute of Infectious Disease, um, the NIH laboratories, UTMB at Galveston, um, Tulane University and University of Pittsburgh. They all did the experiments separately. Now, we'll just look at the panel on the right first, which is showing you the comparison. If you look at the x-axis, it's the different viruses. So there's um, MERS coronavirus, um, and then SARS-1 is the number three one, and then um, SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 are the other panels, um, um, the other five panels there. Um, and you can see that so basically, the higher up it is, the spray factor, the more aerosolized, the, the more potential there is for aerosolization. You can see that 
um, generally the data is showing that the SARS-CoV-2 has more of a tendency to be aerosolized or airborne than MERS and SARS-1. And we accept that with MERS and SARS-1, there is airborne transmission. There's droplet and contact transmission as well, if you want to keep classifying things as droplet. Um, but we accepted it there. There's still a denial of it with SARS-CoV-2, but this, um, this experiment, I think, um, is hard to refute. And what they did then was they looked for viable virus. So if you go back to the panel on the left, go down to number F, and it's showing you viable whole virus, a whole virion, um, 16 hours in the air, 16 hours after aerosolization. So this study found viable virus. Um, the amount of viable virus goes down as time goes on, but you can find viable virus 16 hours later. I think that has major implications for health systems, hospitals, and for healthcare workers, that this is a very contaminated environment and there is a real risk um, of um, infection for health workers and other patients. So the challenges then of COVID-19 control are, firstly, that we have substantial transmission in the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic phases, and that's different from SARS-1, where there was no transmission in pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic phases, and also from things like Ebola, where there was no, it's all, Ebola and SARS are similar in that transmission occurs when you've got symptoms. You can identify who's infectious. And the other thing is that the highest infectious period is the 48 hours before symptoms start and the first day of symptoms, when generally symptoms will be very mild. You might just have a bit of a sore throat. Um, so that makes it super hard to control. Um, and there's now growing evidence of airborne transmission so that all three modes of transmission are important, contact, droplet and airborne. Um, and we've only got non-pharmaceutical interventions at the moment, which brings me back to universal face mask use. There's been a, a range of modelling studies looking at universal face mask use, whether it's with cloth masks, as they've recommended in the US. Um, so in the US, um, they've done it on the, on the assumption that it'll stop onward transmission from people who are in that pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic infectious phase, but it'll also prevent people who are not infected becoming infected, um, particularly if the virus is highly aerosolized. Um, and the one modeling study showed that you can flatten the curve if 20, if, even if a mask is only 20% effective and if 50% if of people wear it. So if enough people wear it, even if the effect of it is modest, you can still have a major population health impact, particularly if, if it's widespread transmission in the community. And of course, um, the importance of testing and case isolation can't be stressed enough. You have to be able to identify all cases, including those who are asymptomatic. There was an aged care outbreak in the US that was published recently as well, which showed that 50% of all, they tested everybody in that nursing home outbreak and 50% of all the infections they identified were asymptomatic. Some of them went on to become, develop symptoms later, but if you don't test high risk asymptomatics, you'll miss cases and it'll cause more transmission. And then the contact tracing and the quarantine of contacts is important for the same reason, to stop onward transmission, to stop the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. And this infection more than any, um, social distancing is really important. It's, it's one of the few effective measures because we can't tell who's infectious. And when you can't tell who's infectious, then stopping people having contact with each other will um, reduce transmission. And that's the rationale for the social distancing. Um, I'll just go back to cases in Australia before I finish up, um, just to say that um, and, and to wrap up about exit strategies. Um, I do believe that um, there were, you know, we've had a restricted testing policy um, to test only um, symptomatic people. So when we first evacuated people from Wuhan on February the 3rd, only those who had symptoms were tested. Um, and when you look at the um, first surge in um, community cases that we started seeing, which is at the beginning of March, we started seeing those cases in the nursing home in Ryde in New South Wales, etc. I didn't know where they had come from necessarily. That's two incubation periods from um, 
the Wuhan evacuations. And uh, my theory is there was were some chains of asymptomatic transmission that were set off because we didn't test the, the asymptomatic people. The Japanese tested all their evacuees from Wuhan and more than half of the infections they identified were in asymptomatic people. Then we had the Diamond Princess coming on February 2nd and that corresponds to another surge in cases that we saw towards the middle to the end of March. Um, and again, we only tested symptomatic people. So I think it's really critical for, and then we move on to a bigger, uh, a bigger picture of the curve. I just want to show, zoom in on those early cases to show you what it looked like. So the Diamond Princess um, there came, arrived on the, we had the evacuees on the 20th. And um, there you can see um, the two incubations to that second surge in cases in Australia where something like 40% of the cases were locally transmitted. Um, and then we had the Ruby Princess dock on the, um, around the 19th of April, um, March, sorry, and two incubations from that is taking us to about now really, um, whether we see an increase in cases after that, I don't know. But if you look at Washington State, they had the first case in the U in Washington State um, at the big, you know, in January. And they had probably three generations of silent transmission before they even realized there was an epidemic going on there. And the reason why you get silent transmission is that 80% of people have mild infection. So you can have a few chains of transmission happening where most people are getting mild infection. And statistically, you won't start seeing those 20% of severe infections until the epidemic's got big enough and grown enough for it to start impacting your health system, to start getting noticed. So I think it is possible to have, you know, three to four generations of transmission before you realise it. And that clearly that was the case in New York City. Their first diagnosis was on the 1st of March. Um, and then by the end of March, it was, you know, complete, um, uh, you know, it was a, a terrible epidemic um, in, in just four weeks. Surely there must have been more transmission that they just hadn't picked up before that. Um, and in terms of what's going, what, where's the next wave of um, infection going to be? Um, I've been keeping an eye on what's happening in India. These are data from the WHO situation reports and a very low number of cases being reported for a country that's the next biggest country after China. Um, and they had their first case reported um, back in January, but um, nothing really for a long time. And you have to wonder if there's an undiagnosed, undetected transmission going on there. Um, so I think um, elimination is still possible. Um, and New Zealand is clearly going for elimination. And that's the, and elimination in, in a technical sense, um, eradication is getting rid of an infection from the world. So SARS-1 is eradicated, smallpox is eradicated. Um, e elimination refers to getting rid of domestic transmission in your own country. So it, we have elimination of measles in Australia. Um, that means that we don't have sustained endogenous transmission of measles in the country, but we have occasional outbreaks that are imported through travel. So I think it's still feasible to aim for that for Australia, where we don't have sustained um, endogenous transmission, but we might get occasional travel related outbreaks that we can contain because we detect them rapidly and completely. Um, but if we, um, I think if we keep schools open and, um, you know, my, my feeling is um, there is transmission in children, probably if they're asymptomatic or mild, they may not be developing antibody responses, but they may still be able to transmit the infection. Um, kids live in families with adults so they can come home and um, transmit. We've certainly seen teachers infected in, in Australia and overseas, and we've seen um, you know teachers die in, in, uh, in the US, for example. So I think, I think uh, you know, with every other respiratory transmissible infection, the highest rates of transmission are just based on the contact between people, which is how respiratory tra infections transmit. Um, it's the highest rate of transmission is in young people and children. So I, I can't see why it wouldn't be the case here. Um, and we need more research. I think the issue of the um, our fecal transmission in kids, that study is also an, an important one that needs more study. If we take, uh, if we um, relax the interventions 
uh, we probably will see an uptick, but if we expand the testing with that, we can um, control it. Uh, and maybe I'll leave that for question time, but I want to finish off by showing you this study, which um, made me quite depressed when I read it really. It was from Mark Lipsitch's group in Harvard, and it's a modeling study that actually um, included some very sophisticated immunological data. And um, what they, the bottom line is, that if we don't have a highly effective vaccine um, in the next few years, we'll be having to live with intermittent periods of lockdown from anywhere from two years to five years. That's what they modelled. And the, the blue bars there, the, the pale blue bars, are the periods of lockdown, which you would have to have until the case numbers went down again and then you could live without lockdown and then the case numbers would rise again and then you'd have to be in lockdown again. And that's quite a sobering thought really to think that <clears throat> um, we may have to live with this virus um, in the foreseeable future. Um, I, you know, I am quite hopeful that we will have a vaccine and it doesn't have to be <clears throat> a highly efficacious vaccine like it has to be for measles, for example. Um, even a less efficacious vaccine could still give us reasonable population health control. Um, but whether we have one in the next two years uh, or, the, or whether we have the best vaccine. And the likely scenario is we'll have one candidate, one vaccine candidate come out, you know, um, as the first vaccine. Um, and if it passes the safety, um, uh, the phase two trials and the safety, et cetera, and the phase three, then it'll um, be used. Um, and then you'll probably see better and better vaccine candidates coming out after that. So, um, and in terms of the genetic um, mutation rate of this virus, it's not like influenza. It shouldn't be anywhere near as difficult. Uh, there shouldn't be that much va vaccine escape. And if there is, it could be, it could be easily addressed. Um, so I might finish there, but all the, all the research I've talked about is um, available at this link um, where you can um, find a link to all the papers that I've mentioned. So happy to take questions. Um, just, oh, we've run out of time. Hi, Rona. Um, if you want to take any questions, that's OK. We can still keep going. But if um, time is not available, we can finish up now. Well, uh, I can. If anyone wants to ask a question, happy to take a question. Um, there are lots of questions. Oh, so where are they? I can find them. Yep. If you just okay. go to the Q&A, okay. um, you can actually sort them by most liked. Um, there's a little filter at the top on the right. Right. OK. It says most recent by default. Uh, right. OK. So if you want to sort it that way. That's OK, so that. That, that OK, I'll do it like that. Um, Australia's geographical location. Yeah, look, I think that we have an advantage, no doubt about it. You know, we're not in the European Union for, for one, uh, without borders. Um, we don't have any land borders. We've only got, you know, air and sea. And that is definitely an advantage for us and for New Zealand. And I think we could think about a coordinated strategy with Australia and New Zealand as a block, uh, and maybe even with the Asian countries nearby who've been very successful, like South Korea. Um, uh, so uh, do I think there'll be a second wave? I think I've already answered that. I think, uh, yes, yes, uh, when we relax restrictions, we will see more cases, whether it's actually a wave and we get um, a big peak again will depend to some extent on um, the expansion of the testing and the human resources capability um, to manage the contact tracing and the testing. So the, the use of the apps for contact tracing is really critical because it overcomes the need for human resources and you need to trace about 10 times as many contacts as you do manage have to manage cases. So it, it's a big ask from a human resource point of view. <clears throat> um, should we be um, focusing on testing and identifying uh, cases in the younger population, yes, yes, because that they're, they're going to be the ones trans silently transmitting. Um, and I think the more we can test and identify cases in those younger groups, um, and I think any asymptomatic high risk. So if you look at the, the current criteria in Australia, 
Um, so contact, close contacts, um, outbreaks in nursing homes, military barracks, it's all closed settings, cruise ships. Um, I think, you know, we could have tested everyone on board on board the Ruby Princess, for example. Um, that would have stopped any onward transmission that might have happened. Um, so if you take all the existing criteria and just add ex uh, asymptomatic as well, and yes, we'll test anyone who's a close contact but is asymptomatic, that's that plus allowing any doctor to order a test if they feel in their judgment it's warranted probably should cover it in terms of really expanding the capability to identify new cases quickly. Um, the duration of viral shedding and infectivity um, after symptom resolution, positive NAT may not necessarily indicate infectious virus. Ah, yes, that's true. Um, but I think some of the studies have looked at viable virus and have found it. Um, and I think you've got to use a precautionary principle. You know, if you're sending someone home um, and you think they could be shedding virus, um, I think uh, to be precautionary, you should make sure they're not, their swabs are negative. <clears throat> Um, asymptomatic people. I think asymptomatic people you test. I don't, I don't, I'm not an advocate for just random testing. I think if you're in an outbreak situation, whether it's a family uh, outbreak setting, um, just test everyone in there. Um, exit models um, propose using people who've already had it to help with contact tracing. I think we don't know enough about the uh, immunity. There's certainly some studies published now that show that people who've recovered, some of them don't develop good levels of neutralizing antibodies, in fact, have very low levels of neutralizing antibodies. Um, many people do develop high levels of antibodies, but some don't. So I think it's risky and um, certainly risky to ask an infected healthcare worker to go and treat people without PPE. We don't know enough about the virus. We need 12 months of follow-up to really understand the immunology of the response. Um, New Zealand. Um, so New Zealand's rates of disease are similar to ours. Um, they've got lower case numbers because it's a much smaller population, but they're obviously going for elimination. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a worthwhile strategy. Um, yeah, viral shedding, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, period of time between infection. So the latent period is probably about uh, seven days um, before you, um, we know the incubation period is up to two weeks. The average is about five, five days. Um, that's the period between um, infection and testing positive, I think. Uh, Delta non PCR confirmed children. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, so the Dong study was from China in the peak of the epidemic. Um, uh, and that study is, just, but that's just one of the studies that included um, uh, suspected cases. Um, the issue here is that it in fact affect you included suspected cases. There's a New England Journal study which was just confirmed cases which pretty much reflected the same findings and a couple of other studies now in children. So basically when you've got a large epidemic you will see children, they won't be the most affected, but you will see children with a moderate and severe infection and you will see children dying and um, that's been confirmed in multiple countries. Um, PCR positive in stools. Uh, yeah, so that argument about viable virus, I mean, I think you just have to use a precautionary principle. Uh, the same argument has been used about the finding of virus in aerosols and um, that study I just mentioned uh, found viable virus 16 days after, uh, 16 hours um, later in the air. So I think, you know, a proportion of it might not be viable, but a proportion of it may be. Um, we need more studies. Um, and in the meanwhile, we need to be precautionary. I think that we've probably sort of run out of time now. Um, there's a lot of other questions. Okay. Thanks, everyone.